Welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, our guests are Ben Poe and Emil Freeberg, both organizers with Occupy St. John's working on issues generated when the multinational retail giant 7-Eleven Inc. opened a new franchise in the working class community of St. John's here in Portland, Oregon. 7-Eleven, a Dallas, Texas-based company privately owned by 7 plus seven and I holdings of Japan announced record store growth in 2012, expecting to have over 50,000 stores worldwide, making them the largest retail, retail chain in the world based on the number of locations. They added 5,000 stores worldwide in 2012 and almost 1,000 just in the United States. Worldwide, they are in Canada, Mexico, Europe, Australia, and Asia, including in China, Hong Kong, Japan, and Taiwan, with nearly 39,000 stores. The company has indicated they want to expand in part by converting mom and pop stores into 7 Eleven stores and via acquisitions. They generated close to $77 billion in sales in 2011. So, welcome to our show. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so. Tell me just a little bit about the Occupy St. John's group. You, how did you, how did you get started? Well, you were there before me. Maybe you should start that one. Um, I, well, I was I was uh, invited to come by Miriam Well uh, or Miriam German. Actually, she's a local musician, and um, she kind of started the group with a few other people. Um, but. Um, at the moment, I'm having a hard time thinking what our first issue was. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, the first issue for me was the 7-Eleven. That's, in fact, what brought me to Occupy St. John's. Uh, I became aware of the uh, the new 7-Eleven being, uh, being proposed in the neighborhood in late 2011. And um, I started seeing petitions going around the neighborhood in opposition to it. and. As I shared that sentiment, I signed that petition and uh, shortly thereafter received an invitation to attend a meeting to discuss it, which turned out to be an Occupy St. John's meeting. And uh, so it is the issue that brought me mm -hmm. to that to that forum. Oh, okay, all right. And, and one other, we'll dive more into this question about 7-Eleven in just a minute, but what other issues has Occupy St. John's worked on? Well, we've worked on a number of things. We, we try to be a resource to the neighborhood and we encourage people or groups to come in and, and bring to the table anything that they'd like to see or that they feel they need some support on from, from a political action group. Uh, one of the things that we were very involved with last spring was uh, efforts to get the um, freight truck traffic off of Fessenden, which is a uh, an arterial residential street in our part of town and it had been pretty much taken over by truck traffic. Uh, there was no safe pedestrian crossings and a large part of the community was isolated by not being able to cross that corridor. And uh, we got involved with that and uh, circulated petitions and uh, did one very, very large scale public demonstration and supported the efforts of the uh, community group that was negotiating to to resolve these issues and we also have a good relationship with the local police and we took advantage of that and encouraging enforcement uh, getting the trucks off Fessenden that was one of our big issues we got involved in the coal train thing and, and that's um, an ongoing issue that's an ongoing one post office uh, the post office was one of our early uh, early things and, and the Portland chapter of uh, Communities and Postal Workers United actually grew out of an Occupy St. John's meeting. Oh, did it? Oh, yeah. okay. All right. T talk about that little, that, that group a little bit for a second. Well, that's a group that is advocating for the survival of the U.S. Postal Service against the onslaught of the privatizers and, and um, and the corporate interests that are trying to undermine the Postal Service in this country. Uh, it's composed primarily of retired postal workers and community members. Um, we try to support the efforts of the postal unions in preserving post office jobs and, and preserving the integrity and standards of delivery that the 
U.S. Postal Service is famous for, mm -hmm. and uh, it's and, and and opposing the closing of processing centers and and the ending of of uh, six day delivery and and rural and urban post offices as well, mm -hmm. uh, with the proposed closure of the Salem plant in a couple of months. It'll now mean that if you want to send a letter from one end of Salem to the other, it's going to have to come up to Portland to be sorted, and it'll take, you know, probably three days instead of one day. Uh -huh. uh, and we found that the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the grease here. The more noise we make, the sl slower the process, mm -hmm. and the more post offices that we've seen at least temporarily saved. Uh -huh. uh, we've worked closely with the Rural Organizing Project. They've been absolute heroes in this struggle, and uh, yeah. of course they have. They have they have a big um, stake in this argument because you know uh, rural post offices are particularly under attack for for being closed, and quite frequently in rural areas, the uh, you know one part one major part of the heart of the communities in rural areas is the post office. Right. It's the only public building in a lot of rural areas. Uh -huh. It's true, and uh, they're so dependent, and it's getting overlooked. And and um, you know, it's a tragedy. I mean, this is something mandated by the Constitution. It's an institution that was founded by Benjamin Franklin, for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. And and we've got a a Congress that's um, just letting it go to. Go to seed. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't want <laughs> right. yes. when, you, when you think about access of people as well, you know, when you have people that are, don't have very much money or very many re many resources that are living in rural areas, post office has flat rates, whereas if they have to be be serviced by a private uh, private mailing company like UPS or something like that, they're not going to have the same access. Mm -hmm. So people who don't have the resources to pay those fees aren't going to be able to get their medications through the mail. You know, it um, it disenfranchises them from the community even more. Even you know. If you don't have money, you can't live in the country, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. You know, mm -hmm. you'll have to move in where your resources are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of little bits and pieces that become affected. Yeah, it was interesting to me that uh, UPS and FedEx and those you know, private delivery companies actually give their packages that they can't deliver themselves, particularly in rural areas, to yeah. the U.S. Post Office they for the U.S. Post Office. The last yeah. mile. Yeah. Yep. The, the, <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, they subcontract uh, yes, to the Post right. Office. Yeah, so if we don't have a U.S. Postal Service that's fully functioning, then people get, can potentially get cut off entirely. And it's the same as with, uh, you know, going back to when the country was first electrifying, the um, uh, private utilities didn't want to go to those areas that had high costs in order to deliver electricity, and that was the whole reason why we ended up with public utility districts, mm -hmm. was because they needed to get the electrification. So the role of public agencies uh, in economic development and in connecting people, uh, it really can't be overstated. No, it can't, and in this case, it's, it's a false crisis. The post office isn't broke, it's a cash cow. That's why all these corporate interests are fighting over it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Then why they did the 2006 uh, Postal Enhancement Accountability Act, or mm -hmm. yeah, to actually take that that right. what is it 5.5 billion dollar payment every single year mm -hmm. as that pre-funding for uh, retirement. For the re and it's the only 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 uh, public agency or corporation, public or private corporation, that has this kind of requirement. Well, let's right. let's 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 talk about 7-Eleven <laughs> before okay. our before sure. our half hour is up. <laughs> right? Sure. Yeah. So 7-Eleven has been on this uh, major major expansion, and it hit St. John's. Yeah. So talk about what happened. It 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 came to our attention because it, it hit the neighborhood, and and Ben can talk a little bit more about of kind of the timeline of how it, that happened. But as we were as we were introduced to 7-Eleven coming in and essentially just bulldozing its way through and and building anyway, even though the community really didn't want it, we started realizing that this was a much bigger issue. And um, and so as you say, it is a global thing. Um, and they have that business conversion program, which is essentially exactly what it sounds like. And they they they. They sell it as if they're, you know, they're philanthropists. They're helping these small businesses. They've got this wonderful inventory system, you know, where you can pretty much, you know, become so efficient, and you can, you know, you can save yourself all this time and this money. And they literally, I mean, they they do actually present it that way, as if they're they're helping these, you know, bodegas and small businesses to be, to to make more money and to be more efficient, etc. 
Um, and, and, and when you're talking about conversions, what they're converting is mom and pop corner grocery stores. Oh yeah, right. yeah, okay. exactly. I mean, Just so we are clear about what we're talking. Yeah, about. what they do is they identify a market, and generally how they identify a market is that there's an existing business there that's making a living, and. Um, uh, like in our neighborhood, um, you know, it, Portland is different than New York City and geographically and otherwise. We have developable space. We have, you know, um, uh, uh, areas that can they can build a building. New York is saturated with buildings, so it's a little bit different, but it's a similar type of thing. But um, biz business conversion then is happening more so in New York City right now with the bodegas. But out here, um, we have the St. John's Deli. Um, we um, uh, anyway, I don't believe that 7-Eleven ever came to them and said, would you like to become a franchise? Which is generally what they do, but I don't think they did that. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, they knew that there was an existing market because the St. John's Deli has been a neighborhood business since 1979, and they've, you know, it's their local people that raised a family on that business. So half a block down, they come in and they want to develop there. Um, and essentially, that's what they're doing all around the country is they push out. They, they see there's a business opportunity because somebody else is there. So they'll come in and they'll push them out, essentially. In New York, they're actually going up to the bodega uh, owners and to these convenience stores and saying, you know, we can help you. We can, you know, we can make it, you know, help you make your business better, become a franchise owner. Um, we will finance you to the buy-in. We will reduce our, our initial buy-in franchise costs. Um, we'll reduce, you know, for a period of time your, you know, your, your, Franchise payments every month, this sort of thing, but uh, the general franchise agreement—you're not—you're not an independent business owner. You're working for a major corporation, and they micromanage the crap out of you. So you're really—you know—it's not—it's not really an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the incentive—you know—I mean, if you—if somebody does become a franchise owner, um, they have to pay the fees. They have to—you know—they have to pay back their buy-in costs. They have to pay in their monthly fees. They pay in a, por uh, a portion of their uh, half, usually. Of their um, of the receipts, and they're accounted every at the end of every month, and they have to, you know, they 7-Eleven expects their their share, of course, as the they franchise they owner. They expect their blood. They really do, <laughs> and um, you know, um, part of it being, you know, their their marketing is that so all you can go to a 7-Eleven and you know what to expect. You know the kind of service you'll get. You know the kind of products that are there. Um, you know, uh, you know what the hours are going to be. You know, there's a uniformity, and that's what mm -hmm. makes them so popular. Um, it's also kind of what makes them kind of gross. But um, nonetheless, uh, so being a franchise owner, you have to follow all those branding rules. Um, but you also, um, you know, you have to use their suppliers. Uh, you have to buy your used equipment directly from 7-Eleven. You can't, you know, buy it from elsewhere, et cetera. So your choices as a small business owner are really few. Um, uh, Anyway, it's uh, it's not a, it's not really a great a great thing. Mm -hmm. When I was reading about it, the more I the more I thought about it, it seemed like corporate col um, colonialism, basically. You know, they're coming in and they're saying, oh, you know, we're going to help you and we're going to help you do business better and this sort of thing. But they're really just looking at and making a profit and getting getting a monopoly on the market. Mm -hmm. Is that's what they're looking for? Mm -hmm. um, and if the franchise owner actually doesn't make it, you know, and their incentive, of course, is to make it, so that means they're probably going to be hiring people at very low wages. They're not going to give anybody hours above half time. They're not going to pay benefits. Um, and uh, so the job quality for their employees is not going to be very good um, because they need to make a profit so they can make a living. Um, and uh, along those lines of being sort of colonialism, uh, there was always this stereotype of like the the immigrant um, convenience store owner, mm -hmm. and to a certain extent, I think part of that is because you get someone who's you know who's from another country where there are very lax labor laws, and they're willing to you know and they're willing to work very very hard, um, and uh, in order to make a business work, they're given an opportunity to do so, um, and as an owner, uh, they don't they're not restricted to forty hours a week. They're also not restricted by immediate family members to 40 hours a week. So they can literally go in there and, and work themselves to death, essentially, to try to make this profitable. And if they don't make it profitable, 7-Eleven um, just sells the franchise to somebody else. Okay. Hmm. And, and so uh, they, they would sell the franchise, but the building uh, and the equipment would still be owned by the person who has the franchise, or, or I, th I think it depends. Um, in the case of our local 7-Eleven, um, it was a developer. It was a local Portland developer 
who did who developed the properties and owns the building. And mm -hmm. so Seven Eleven has leased the building from this person, mm -hmm. and then the franchise would be sold. and And I'm not sure exactly how that that particular arrangement is made, okay. or if it's if it's common to other. Okay. To yeah, other and so a, a typical mom and pop grocery store or or a convenience store would be would most likely the building would be owned by the by the store owner, uh, and the equipment and the everything would be owned by the would be owned by the by the owner of the store itself. Yeah. Whereas now you've got a much more complicated uh, relationship between the the, the building developer, yeah. the uh, supplier of the equipment, and uh, the the franchise owner, and and so forth. And, right. and what you really see there is that the the mom and pop store uh, decisions about where to buy uh, product, where to buy equipment, uh, who to hire, what hours they make, and so forth that would have been made by the owner of the store and now being made by 7-Eleven. Corporate. In yeah. the corporate headquarters you, you in might Dallas, well, Texas. You might as well be just managing a, managing mm -hmm. a chain store mm -hmm. right. rather, than you're, you know, rather than being a franchise owner. Mm -hmm. the, the difference is that you take on all the risk. If you don't do a very good job, you know, if you don't, if you don't um, cut corners where, you know, or, or basically do what you're supposed to do but cut corners where, we, where you can and where is that going to be? Probably in labor. Mm -hmm. It's going to be on, on your employees mm -hmm. because you have all these other requirements for the branding and everything else. Um, yeah. Okay, right. When I was okay, right. when I was doing a little research before this program, I uh, didn't realize that Seven Eleven was w was almost a worldwide. I, I don't think they have any uh, locations in Africa yet, but they're pretty much every place else in the in the world. Uh, and I saw pictures of stores in Taiwan and mm. China and uh, Australia. They all look alike. Mm. Yeah. They all look alike everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was recently in Denver, and and there was a Seven Eleven store, and it looked just like the Seven Eleven store that I might visit here in Portland. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a there's a really bad movie called um, Dev Demolition Man with Sylvester Stallone, and there's a scene <laughs> there's a scene in that movie where. Um, they're going out to dinner with like the prime minister or whatever it is, and um, and Sandra Bullock says, "We're you know, well, we're going to meet him at this restaurant at Taco Bell," and he laughs and says, "You know, Taco Bell, you know, it's, it's set in the future, Taco Bell. Well, we're, t we're having a fancy dinner at Taco Bell," and she says, "Well, yes, but you know, from the franchise wars of 2023, <laughs> all <laughs> restaurants are Taco Bell now, <laughs> and it's this dystopic thing, and it uh -huh. seems sort of ridiculous, but you know, it's it's not that far fetched uh -huh, when you yeah, think about." Right. This, you know, where where literally all convenience stores you could have, you know, one every three blocks in a in a, a an urban area, and mm -hmm. they're all Seven Elevens. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> and, and in St. John's, this is not the only Seven Eleven, is that right? No, it's not. There are two established Seven Elevens in St. John's, as well as I believe five other convenience type stores. Within within about a mile radius of our community center, mm -hmm. um, now six. Now, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, the uh, the other Seven Eleven store that's right down the road on North Lombard from from the new one felt betrayed by this because he had been given verbal assurances that they would not put in a competing Seven Eleven store that close, mm -hmm. but uh, he didn't have anything in writing. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. and. Um, and yeah, I mean, there was widespread resistance in the neighborhood from the word go, and, and part of it was because of the, the saturation both with liquor outlets and with convenience stores, including, as I say, we already had two 7-Elevens and a plaid pantry, as well as a, a number of independent, independent stores. Um, that was certainly one of the main issues for a lot of people, the, the saturation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, for, for me, that was a factor too, Al although for me, a lot of it has to do with resenting the corporate arrogance, or at least what I perceive as corporate arrogance, when it was clear from the get-go that there was resistance. I mean, we had almost 2,000 signatures in one neighborhood, I mean, St. John's is a big neighborhood. There's what eleven or twelve thousand 
residents in St. John, mm -hmm. but for 2,000 of those people to sign a petition about mm -hmm. one convenience store mm -hmm. is extraordinary. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that is a neighborhood united in, in my book, and for them to ignore that, to come back and saying, oh, hey, you know, our, this store could lose money for 10 years and we don't care, We're, we'll still be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, that's that's like a battle cry in, in the war between free enterprise and corporate capitalism. Uh -huh. You know, that's saying that the standards that, that apply to... The normal business... To, to a normal business right. don't apply to us. Uh -huh. We're right. bigger than that. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, right. We're yeah. the phone company or whatever. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right, it, yeah. it, did, it did kind of become personal because uh -huh. we, you know, we, our friends and our neighbors have been, have been planning this community for years and going to neighborhood association meetings and all this kind of thing and and uh, you know people putting a lot of dedication and work into it and um, uh, we have a good community and mm -hmm. so when yeah when when they came in and just said well you know our only obligation is to attend a neighborhood association meeting and we did that and we're sorry you don't want us here but we're coming anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it did get a lot of people motivated mm -hmm. yeah when I was uh, well, I, I grew up here in Portland and in uh, probably uh, about 1968 or 1970. Well, when I grew up, there were a lot of mom and pop stores. Uh, I grew up in the area where Portland State is now. And there were a lot of mom and pop stores there, and most of them were owned by Greek immigrants. And probably in 1968 through 1970, therefore, thereabouts, uh, many, many of them closed, both because Portland State was expanding and because uh, 7-Eleven and Plaid Pantry were expanding. And one of the favorite w stores that I went to as a, as a kid to buy my penny candy and my soda pops and stuff uh, was right, almost right, was on the same block as the future 7-Eleven. And the 7-Eleven came in and they closed. Uh -huh. I mean, it was, it was just that dramatic that you could see uh, those, those things happening. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so so that that process because uh, Seven Eleven has indicated that they're you know that they want to do these business conversions converting to mom and pop stores, uh, and uh, and then they also are uh, buying up other small chains of stores, local chains to to expand their businesses. So they they really have a. Uh, a model of corporate uh, world domination for convenience stores. Yeah. And they're well on the way with uh, 50,000 store locations yeah. at this point in time. Staggering. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. It right. is. And and honestly, I mean, I don't think um, you know, I mean like Occupy is not against uh is not against uh uh, businesses or free trade or anything like that. We're basic, you know. I mean, it, as it's well, just. I, I'm, I'm going to correct you. Oh, sorry. You probably are against free trade. Oh. You probably are in favor of fair trade. Fair trade, right? right. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's um, uh, it's 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 um, predatory practices, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. that are really, really, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's the big thing. Yeah. So with with about a minute and a half to two minutes left. Oh. Uh, what was what were the other major issues with 7-Eleven in in St. John's? Well, from the get-go, uh, their their whole permitting process, land use stuff was was real dodgy. I mean, the 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 store is located on a on a major commercial street, but all the access and egress to the store is on residential mm -hmm. side streets. Which has had a huge impact on 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 the folks that live on those streets. Um, there was obviously concern about competition with local stores, and um, the neighborhood association tried to negotiate with them to negotiate a good neighbor agreement, and they rejected those efforts. They basically imposed their corporate standard good neighbor agreement and uh, and that was good enough for the city but it wasn't good enough for the neighborhood sure. association mm -hmm. um, they did not respond to the petitions to consider finding another site uh, so I'm sorry but our time actually <laughs> is is up and so I want to thank you Ben for being here okay and thank Emil you. Thank, thank you for being here great okay so uh, let's see. So we have been talking with uh, Ben Poe, 
and Emil uh, Freebird with Occupy St. John's about 7-Eleven. So this has kind of been the story of when 7-Eleven comes to your community. All right. So, um, so we are going to close our program today with a video clip from the folks at We Are Not Broke, a documentary which tells the story of the U.S. corporations dodging billions of dollars in income tax and how seven fed up Americans take their frustrations to the streets and vow to make corporations pay their fair share. When corporations dodge paying their taxes, someone else pays them instead, and that would be you watching this program and your families and friends. U.S. Spurg recently released a report stating that offshore tax havens cost average taxpayers $1,026 a year and small businesses $3,067 a year. Re read the report from the link on the Alliance for, the Alliance for Democracy website at afd-pdx.org on the media tab. Our friends at We Are Not Broke estimate that American taxpayers pay an extra $150 billion a year to cover the taxes not paid by tax dodgers like Coca-Cola, Walmart, and Microsoft, and perhaps 7-Eleven. I, I, I don't know about that last one. But, so uh, call your U.S. Senator and ask him to support the Cut, just, uh, Cut Unjustified Tax Loopholes Act, which is Senate Bill 268. So we'll watch this video for a second. There's a belief that the offshore world is somehow the province of shady businessmen and rich folks who set up offshore bank accounts to cheat on their taxes. And that belief is false. Basically, every major technology company and every major drug maker in the U.S. relies on the offshore world for a very significant portion of its profits. They just use the international tax rules to shift profits out of the United States and other high tax countries into low tax countries. And that's called transfer pricing. The whole game in transfer pricing is to allocate as much income as possible to a low tax country or a tax haven and as much expenses as possible to a high tax country like the U.S. The problem is that you have companies that are allocating for tax purposes the bulk of their profits to parts of the world where in some cases they have no employees they have no sales, they have no real economic activity of any kind. By any reasonable standard, when most of your business is in the United States and most of the intellectual know-how, research, and productivity is in the United States, the profits that are taxed should also be in the United States. So don't forget to contact your U.S. Senator and ask him to support the Cut Unjustified Tax Loopholes Act, that's Senate Bill 268. We want to thank our volunteers who donate their time to be on our show and get us on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Ethan Scarrow, Tom Thomas, and Brad Leach. And thank you to our audience for watching. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.